Welcome to Voices of Care, the podcast series from New Cross Healthcare, which seeks to get to the very heart of the issues facing the health and social care sector by engaging with and with the help of experts leading the debate on how we can truly enable the healthcare workforce of the future. I'm Sahel Mirza and today we're going to be looking at social care and in particular residential care. According to some, it is facing an existential crisis. And it's important that we hear from people who can give a national voice of what is going on in the sector. And in that regard, I'm honoured to invite and welcome James Tugendhat, the Chief Executive of HC1. James, I'm so delighted to welcome you and thank you for giving us your time. It's a pleasure to be here and I can't think of a more important topic for us to be discussing. A- absolutely. The current Health Secretary, of course, with the uh, alphabet, has yes. placed C at the very centre of uh, priorities. I'd like, if I may, just to step back and look at the challenges facing the sector, particularly workforce challenges. You know the numbers, and they are stark. The level of vacancies, skills for care, Health Foundation saying uh, social care is in a desperate situation. You have a um, long and a deeply experienced uh, career within health and social care, and at HC1, what's your perspective of how profound the challenge is for the workforce? Oh, I mean, there's no doubt that this is one of the toughest markets, one of the toughest set of circumstances that I think anyone uh, has has in their living memory. You know, where the NHS is seeing vacancy rates of 10, 11%, the sector is seeing vacancy rates of 15 uh, plus percent. And of course, all this against the backdrop of thankfully very high employment levels in the country and, and very low unemployment. And so, you know, we've got this really difficult combination of people now needing care after the disruption of COVID. And so really strong demand for what we do, and yet really few people to come and support us in giving that care. Absolutely. And that those wider macro trends of a tight labour market, um, I think are going to be here for quite some time. I think so. I mean, w- what we're certainly seeing post-COVID is that the long-term trends for ever more complex care and people needing care Uh, towards the end of their life are really here, are are growing. Um, You know, the workforce is going to be tight, I think, for some time to come. And so when you've got growing demand, uh, yes, this is a crisis we're going to have to contend with for many years ahead. Absolutely. What's interesting over the COVID period, I think the dial was turned um, favourably in terms of recognition of the contribution that social care makes across the health and social care landscape. And uh, the New Cross Healthcare Care Survey um, conducted by YouGov found that 80% of the general population now believe and think that the care sector is as important as the NHS. So I think that's been one of the real positives, you know, and we now really talk about health and social care, uh, and it's not just health. And I think people have realised that we're an indispensable part of the system. And actually, those lines that were cut going back to, you know, the creation of the NHS in 1947 were always arbitrary. The, you know, most of, uh, so much of social care now is supporting really complex needs, frailty, dementia. These are clinical conditions. There isn't a real division between health and social care. It's just one continuum. And I think having that general sentiment and understanding will help the debate around the bigger issues around the social care sector. I wanted to just um, have your insight because we're, we're in a new landscape as well. Um, of course, integrated care systems yeah. are here now on a statutory basis. Yeah. Um, they offer hope of a systems approach and perhaps drawing in all elements of health and social care to work together in a way perhaps that does begin to solve part of the workforce crisis. Yes. No, I I think it really does. And I mean, I'm always an optimist. And, uh, you, you know, and so I think the idea of creating a responsibility for supporting a whole population and the idea that care should be delivered to each of us as individuals in the setting that most makes sense um, and that we should be looked at as people, as individuals, not as conditions, uh, I think is exactly right. Um, the idea that people move between social care and health care, the idea that actually uh, with so much of social care supported by nursing, it's the same professionals in both sectors – uh, and but really simply, we're not going to fix the backlog in the NHS and manage the waiting lists if we're not able to ensure that we have the right discharges into social care. 
And so if we can't have enough people in social care, we're not going to solve health care either. So, yes, I think the ICSs do represent a real step in the right direction. Of course, the key is how they work in practice. And, and time will, will tell. Um, you've talked about uh, the demand and the need for workers now. The Health and Social Care Committee uh, delivered its report in July, of course, which you're familiar with. Um, its estimates drawing on uh, think tank uh, research is that over the next decade or so, we need 490,000 yeah. more workers within care. Um, and there is a recruitment challenge, if, despite uh, the, the promotion of parity of esteem. Uh, the New Cross Healthcare Survey found that 67% of, of those considering entering social care didn't know how to navigate their way into the yes. sector. Um, I wanted to touch upon a really important initiative that HC1 has been delivering, which is the Rewarding Career Campaign. Yeah. It's been a, a, you've been shortlisted for a number of awards. Can you expand upon the philosophy behind that and the practice that, uh, that's evolved? So one of the great pleasures of my job is spending time with our colleagues in our homes. And for most of uh, our colleagues, the biggest single group of our colleagues are long-serving because for them, care's not a job, it's not even a profession, it's a vocation. Mm. That they know the power of the love that they can give and the love that they can get and wouldn't contemplate doing anything else. And what we wanted to help showcase and demonstrate, both through that campaign but in how we manage recruitment, is all that is so deeply rewarding at an emotional level um, about care, but also to take uh, a position on reward as well as recognition so that we were able to both as a business and working with the sector as a sector to step towards pay that truly recognises the skill and the commitment of those that deliver the care. Absolutely. And I'm uh, interested to, that you use the four-letter word, uh, the love that can be given. Uh, and it really truly is a vocation for people that choose this pathway. It is. And whilst being a vocation and whilst being deeply rewarding, it is also a really physically demanding job. It's a very skilled job. And back to some of what you and I have talked about over the years around training and development, it's a job that if you're not properly equipped to do, is going to be even more challenging and, and at times emotionally confronting. And so what we want to do in, de in talking about rewarding careers is to show that there's a career path mm -hmm. in showing the career development, in showing the growth, in showing that the financial rewards need to be there, um, but most of all in preparing you for a life as a carer and demonstrating that, you know, our most senior managers all started um, you know, in uh, homes, in rooms, doing the care. And I guess the full, it runs the full gamut because you're, you're a top 50 apprenticeship employer. So if that's the entry level, um, yeah. I know you're very passionate about apprenticeship as a mechanism to help people. It's a great mechanism. We have nearly a thousand apprentices um, on a workforce of 18,000. Um, and it, again, apprentices fit perfectly with the whole rewarding careers approach of training, development, and preparing people to be able to do the profession that is care. And again, uh, embarrassing in the sense that it's shortlisted for so many awards, but I wanted to highlight that that pathway that people should be able to see, leadership in care, social care leadership awards. So you've had um, recognition for your workforce across all levels. So, so we're very honoured by some of the um, accolades we've had, but we're also... Uh, need to be very clear that we have a long, long way to go. Hmm. And, you know, we still have high, very high turnover, both within HC1 and, and the sector. The, um, you know, in uh, moving so many of our colleagues towards foundation living wage, we've made real steps forward. Um, but we're still so far from the level of compensation that would really be akin to the skill involved uh, in in uh, the profession of care. Um you know, there's so much more we can do about both uh, all the daily acts of recognition, um, the support on the job, just having enough time to do the job well, especially as the needs of those we care for increase, uh, giving colleagues the flexibility to be able to work the times that best fit with their needs and their lives. 
um, as well as that long-term training and development so that they can uh, either uh, develop as managers or they can develop uh, through our nurse assistant and nurse associate program to be clinicians. We're just at the beginning. So we're excited about the recognition, but we're very humble about how far we have to go. No, your candor as ever is refreshing. And, and perhaps I mean, there is hope and talk of a, uh, a workforce strategy that uh, might encompass both health or indeed should encompass both health and social care. Um, perhaps that will provide a context where this can be done. Yes. You know, and I think as, as government... Uh, you know, I would we would love to see the government develop a really integrated workforce strategy, both around where we're going to find enough colleagues or would be colleagues to come into care, and then most importantly, how we align uh, remuneration, training, development, certification, uh, vocational uh, uh, awards um, across health and social care. Uh, you know, just at a really practical level, uh, you know, we are a very large employer of nurses. If if nurses could move across the NHS and social care, keeping pension rights and other things, just think how much easier that would make it for professionals who really enjoy um, uh, changing the care setting depending on their stage of life. Uh, and the statistics do show from the labour market that... Uh uh, the younger generation, if I can call them that, are, are very much um, committed to the idea of portfolio careers and being able to move seamlessly across care settings. I, I you know, I, I don't know anyone who in their job uh, doesn't want to be met where they are to be able to bring their full self uh, to work, who's not struggling, whether young or older, to balance work and life. And so I think in the end, whether as an employer uh, or as a sector, we have to be more flexible. Um, it's the only way that uh, we can keep colleagues with us for the long term. No, absolutely. Touching upon the support um, element, you mentioned the wider context of uh, the workforce. Um, I have to address uh, well-being, burnout. Yeah. This was obviously uh, the subject of uh, the Health and Social Care Select Committee report last year. Um, the New Cross Healthcare Care Survey uh, has found that 38% of care workers are reporting that their mental health has worsened over the last 12 months, in contradistinction to 17% saying it's improved. We know there's a challenge. Just wanted to have you shed some light about some of the initiatives that you're doing. I know a number of your well-being coordinators have also received recognition and shortlisting. So I know it's it, it's a subject very close to your heart. Uh, well, well, the first thing I would say is that I think for many, uh, COVID was truly traumatising. And, uh, and I think the stress that comes with trauma is really hard to understand uh, and... Um, uh, uh, and just really serious. And then on top of that, when you have a situation where there's far greater demand for what we do and a shortage, um, all the hard work falls back on often the most committed colleagues and the longer serving colleagues. So you're working harder. Um, with the cost of living crisis, yep. uh, life is more expensive. Um, you've got... Um, this sort of uh, the 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 weight of the past experience uh, of covid you know and, and often with uh, care colleagues you don't have to scratch much below the surface before people really do uh, you know their their emotions come to the fore around what they've been managing um so yes that's a long way of saying i think we do have uh, a real crisis and we really do need to support and i think a lot of the well-being um, is about really, really practical stuff. Yep. So the first thing, you know, back to that flexibility point, is just enabling people to be able to balance their work and life and have more flexible hours, to, to work hours that work for them, to be able to take the time off they need. It, for us, it's about really practical things, like ensuring every carer is able to have a hot meal during their shift um, so that, uh, you know, they can do that. It's around... Um, uh, basic things like um, financial support and advice. You know, so we have programs uh, uh, that we're just uh, about to go live with so that you can access your wages earlier if you yep. need it, so that you can very easily do extra shifts, but also getting financial advice. And 
on how to navigate the care, on how to navigate the benefit system, uh, you know, and all those financial issues that are most important uh, for our colleagues. So, you know, it's about that tangible support, but then it's so much of it is about the leadership that our home managers are able to give to colleagues, just being there at the right time. No, uh, absolutely. Um, I want to slightly go off at a tangent. Um, we're, we're talking about the, your your recruitment campaign for which you've been recognised, um, making the social care sector a, a pathway for people for careers. Homegrown talent, yeah. extraordinarily important. But just want to touch upon uh, international recruitment. Yeah. Um, a task force was set up um, in the summer uh, by the government to, to tackle this issue yeah. because the, it, in recognition that short term at least we do need to pull that lever. I'd just be interested to get your view on how that works and any examples of success that you've seen, because it, it is a key element as of the short term. Uh, it is. It is a really key element. And, and fully, uh, we, we process about 3,500 applications on any given week. Um, and, uh, you know, 17, 1,800 of those would come from overseas. So there's both a, a real desire for people to come and uh, join the profession of care and, uh, as we talked about, um, a real need. Um, so whilst we need to ensure that we uh, uh, really tap into that opportunity and, you know, there's lots the government can do to simplify the visa process yeah. to ensure that, you know, this program is, is here to stay... In the end, the most important thing about facilitating international recruitment comes back to the most important thing about providing the right support for carers today, which is actually the pastoral care, the support that enables people to stay. Because um, the care, care's tough enough as it is. If you're moving from another country, trying to find somewhere to live, if you don't have that support, um, you'll really burn out. No. Absolutely. Um, and I just wanted to touch upon um, inclusion, diversity. Yeah. Um, your organisation has a very diverse working uh, workforce. You're serving uh, populations right yeah. across uh, the UK. Um, that's been an initiative, I think, has been central also to what the work that you've been doing over the last couple of years. Uh, so again, we need to do much more in this area. But, um, you know, our, our purpose is to give those in our care their best life. We are, uh, the, the bulk of what we do is local authority, authority yep. and NHS funded care. So we uh, support um, an incredibly diverse community, a community as diverse as the country with, with homes from the north of Scotland to the south of England. Um, and, and we have a workforce that represent that same diversity and we're really proud um, of that. Um, so how both our residents, uh, how our workforce can bring their full selves to work and be themselves at work, and um, how we can feel that our residents are met where they are, these are the really important things. So diversity and inclusion can't be an initiative. It has to be at the core of what we're about if we're to meet those we care for and those who do the caring where they are so that they can feel that they're at home. Uh, and I think it goes to the heart of the issue of culture. Yeah. And I, you, you were on record when you joined um, HC1, that's perhaps a, a key element, or maybe the key element of why you joined, uh, was the fact that it was known and is known and is very proud to be known as the kind care company. Uh, I want you to expand upon that because it's very easy to look at that word and regard it as, is, is it a platitudinous or a a PN for popularity, but you describe it as a powerful, transformative call to action. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I've worked for lots of different institutions, enterprises, some great, you know, and but not that many have known exactly why they exist and what matters most about what mm. they do. And what I felt HC1 had worked out for itself was what matters most about the giving of care and the receiving of care is the kindness with which it is given. Um, and so, you, you know, for, for us being the kind care company, it, it, it's not a marketing thing. It's what we believe makes care uh, 
it's at the very core of care. And it's not a soft and fluffy thing. Hmm. If you meet the person where they are that you are caring for, you're simply going to deliver better care. Um, if people feel that um, they're recognized for not just the clinical quality, but the quality of life that they're supporting, you will deliver better health outcomes. Um, now, the important thing for us is, is how we turn um, a sort of a guiding purpose into a real tangible framework of mm. how we teach the practice of care and how we ensure that we talk to those we care for about what matters most about the care they receive so that we can meet them where they are. And, and is that that's from day one in terms of a training mechanism, in terms of uh, aspirations, in terms of the delivery, and even in agreements with the people who, who commission the care? Uh, yes. So I wouldn't say we're there now, <laughs> but that's exactly where we need to get to. So a lot of it is uh, just constantly asking those we care for and their families what matters most, not assuming uh, we know and then, yes, from the very start of induction, um, it's how we train the practice of care. So it's not about the task, but yes. about how the person felt when they were supported in whatever the uh, the need was. So the actual experience. It's of the care. experience. It's the experience. You know, it, it, you know, if someone, um, you know, it, it's really easy to look part. You know, when you're doing a difficult job like care. It's really easy just to get into the task. Oh, someone needed a glass of water. I'll just drop it off in their room. Well, that's not the same as have they been able to drink? What else did they Absolutely. did they want? So much of what we do is very, very intimate. How do we bring all the respect of that someone would expect in providing that support? Oh, absolutely. And I think um, what I've taken from our conversation today is that uh, the two look four letter words actually kind yeah. uh, and also hope yes. uh, there's a landscape of uh, transformation uh, which if we get it right and if uh, the advocacy continues about where social care plays a central role there is actually an opportunity for those wanting to enter the profession to make a profound difference to the country a huge dif a huge potential to make a difference from day one and of course you opened with the sector challenges but these are all within our ability to solve with so much turnover already in the sector and um, if we just halve that half the problem uh, would go away um, and when you talk to colleagues who leave most a, a big percentage of them didn't leave because they didn't love the job they left because they didn't feel they could do the job I think therein is the the clarion call for uh, continual and uh, constant change and improvement uh, James Dugandant, thank you very much uh, for your time and uh, your characteristic candour. Thank you for yours. You're welcome. If you've enjoyed this episode of Voices of Care, please like, follow or subscribe wherever you receive your podcasts. And if you want to receive information about how we are truly enabling the healthcare workforce of the future, please visit newcrosshealthcare.com forward slash voices of care. In the meantime, I'm Sahail Mirza. Goodbye and thank you. Mm -hmm.